The loop of Henle is the structure that allows us to concentrate our urine, and it does so because of a counter-current multiplication. If we look at the nephron, this is the loop of Henle. We're coming in here from the glomerulus at about 300 milliosmoles isosmotic with plasma. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle is impermeable to water. As we move around the loop of Henle, nothing's happening. We are 300, everything's isosmotic. Suddenly, sodium gets pumped out of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Since water cannot follow it, that means the fluid is becoming more dilute. The descending limb, however, is relatively impermeable to salts, but highly permeable to water. So as the salts are moving out of the ascending limb, water will follow by osmosis into the more concentrated region. And so we begin to see a concentration building up right down here at this elbow, this U-turn. If we keep doing this, we will get more and more concentrated. However, this is a short loop. In a short loop, the ability to concentrate is relatively small, and that's because of two reasons. One is we don't have very many sodium pumps on the ascending limb, and the transit time is relatively short through this limb. There's not a lot of time to pump out the salts. The distal tubule, we're looking at very dilute urine. The fluid that's moving down the collecting duct, the medullary portion of the collecting duct, is beginning to lose water because of this high concentration in the interstitial fluid until we reach a maximum of 500, in this example, 500 milliosmoles, which is the maximum concentration in extracellular fluid. If I make this loop a little bit longer, I increase the transit time, I increase the number of pumps I can put on this loop, I can increase the concentration at the base. So there's more sodium being pumped out, it's becoming more dilute, more water is moving out through osmosis from the descending limb, becoming more concentrated. And then we turn around, we come back down through that concentrated solution surrounding the collecting duct. Water then moves by osmosis out of the collecting duct, and we now produce a fairly concentrated urine. Well, if we continue increasing the size of this loop, we now have a longer period of time that the fluid is in the tubule, more pumps. We now concentrating up to 12 to 1400 milliosmoles per liter. And that means the surrounding fluid is going to have 12 to 1400 milliosmoles per liter. When we get to the distal tubule, we have some more sodium moving out. We have some in the late distal tubule. We do have some water moving out. But the best we can hope to get in the cortex is isosmotic with plasma. We'll never see concentration here. We can get back to 300 here as we lose water. As we move down through the medullary portion of the collecting duct, we can see a tremendous amount of water being reabsorbed. Urine now can be concentrated up to, in this case, about 1,400 milliosmoles per liter. Now, with humans, 1,200 or 1,400 seems to be our maximum concentrating ability. There are some desert rodents, like the kangaroo rat, that can concentrate their urine well over 2,000 milliosmoles per liter. Students often ask me, why do we make this concentration? And the answer is very clear. It's the collecting duct. The only way we can reabsorb water is if we first develop a high concentration outside the collecting duct to allow water to move. Reptiles lack loops of Henle. Their nephrons are straight. The best the reptile can hope to concentrate their urine is isosmotic with plasma. There's no countercurrent multiplication occurring in reptiles. They can dilute their urine, but they cannot concentrate it any higher than plasma. There's another structure in the loop of Henle, and that's called the vasa recta. This is our blood vessels that come down and surround the loop of Henle. And these are permeable to both salt and water. So they will easily come into osmotic equilibrium with the surrounding tissue and then back again to 300. So this is where we pick up excess water, we pick up excess salts through this region and bring it back. We're looking here at the glomerular capillaries, the Bowman's capsule, the proximal tubule. We're still in the cortex. Down here, we're in the medulla. We see the descending limb, the ascending limb, back into the cortex, we see the distal tubule here, the cortical portion of the collecting duct, and then the medullary portion of the collecting duct. And as I pointed out, as long as we're in the cortex, there's no concentrating ability. The best we can hope to achieve is isosmotic with plasma. But once we come down into the medulla, we can now begin to remove water from the collecting duct and then recapture that water in the vasa recta. 
Surrounding the tubules, we see paratubular capillaries. This is where we actually pick up water. This is an extension of the efferent arteriole. It then comes down, back up around, making up the vasorecta. Paratubular capillaries, which surround the nephron, is where we're picking up all the excess salts and water and then bringing it back. This little diagram shows that we really have bundles within these lobes, bundles of collecting ducts, nephrons, and vasorecta. There's not a single loop of Henle, its collecting duct, its vasorecta, and then next to it another one. These actually are put together into bundles. Now let's look at what's happening here in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. First, we start off with sodium potassium ATPase pumps and open potassium channels. And we have some potassium channels also located on the apical membrane. The main sodium uptake mechanism is this sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter. Chloride moves out through channels back into the paratubular capillaries. Sodium has to be pumped out. In addition, we make hydrogen ions. Since these cells are metabolizing, they're always producing CO2. CO2 in water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase produces hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. The hydrogen ions then are exchanged for sodium. So here's our second sodium uptake mechanism. Bicarbonate then moves out into the plasma. There's also a paracellular pathway. And although this is relatively small in terms of sodium movement, sodium can move along with potassium or calcium or magnesium through this paracellular pathway and end up in the surrounding space and even into the paratubular capillaries. But water is incapable of moving. If you've listened to my discussion on aquaporins, you will recognize that there are no aquaporins on the apical membrane of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. We can move sodium out of the lumen through the cell, pump it back out, but water will not follow. I want to talk a little bit about how diuretics work in helping to control sodium and water excretion. Diuretics increase water and solute excretion, urine output. They, for the most part, inhibit sodium reabsorption. So I'm showing here a table of the different diuretics. An osmotic diuretic, we use mannitol. Although glucose is an osmotic diuretic, we would never use glucose for that purpose. Acetazolamide, furosemide, the thiazide diuretics, amylaride, which is a potassium sparing diuretic, uh, are used. And you can look through this to try to see what is being lost and what is being conserved with each of these diuretics. I've placed on here color coding to give you an idea where these different diuretics work. Osmotic diuretics, mannitol, glucose, and even urea, work primarily in the proximal tubule and even down into the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, acetazolamide for example, work primarily in the proximal convoluted tubule. Thiazide diuretics in the distal tubule, potassium sparing diuretics, spironolactone, mamilaride, work here in the late distal tubule and early collecting duct. And here we're seeing the loop diuretics. Furosemide, for example, works in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So in that ascending limb, the loop diuretics then block the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transport mechanism, decreasing sodium uptake. This has two effects. Number one, it allows sodium to continue moving through the tubules, leading to sodium and water loss. It also serves to decrease the concentration gradient that can be established outside of the loop of Henle. As the collecting duct moves down through this less concentrated extracellular fluid, osmotic movement of water is decreased. So more water is lost because we've reduced the osmotic gradient. More water is lost because we've kept the sodium chloride and potassium in the tubular fluid longer. So therefore, it will bring water with it, and we will increase our urine output. These loop diuretics are very potent. Furosemide abuse will mimic Barter's syndrome. One form of Barter's syndrome is a mutation in this sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter. So loop diuretics are going to mimic Barter's syndrome. Thiazide diuretics work on the sodium chloride co-transport mechanism in the distal tubule. Potassium sparing diuretics work on the epithelial sodium channels. These are those aldosterone sensitive channels that I discussed in the aldosterone talk. By blocking sodium entry, you reduce potassium exit. Because sodium is not coming in, potassium is not being kicked out through these open potassium channels. So we lose less potassium here. The potassium sparing diuretic then, spironolactone for example, allows us to lose salts, sodium and chloride and water without a great deal of loss of potassium. Acetazolamide works on carbonic anhydrase. 
there's a membrane-bound carbonic anhydrase that is responsible for converting bicarbonate and hydrogen ions into carbonic acid and eventually CO2 and water. The CO2 can move right back in, normally is converted back into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. This is how we have reabsorbed bicarbonate. By blocking this enzyme, bicarbonate cannot come back into the cell, and it's going to be excreted, usually with sodium. So sodium and bicarbonate will end up in the bladder along with water. That concludes this discussion.